Preface Now that my systematic theology is again being reprinted, the preface can be very brief. It is not necessary to say much about the nature of the work, since it has been before the public for more than 15 years and has been used extensively. I have every reason to be grateful for its kind reception, for the favorable testimony of many reviewers, and for the fact that the book is now used as a textbook in many theological seminaries and Bible schools in our country, and that requests were even received from abroad for permission to translate it into other languages. These are blessings which I had not anticipated, and for which I am deeply grateful to God. To Him be all the honor. And if the work may continue to be a blessing in many sections of the Church of Jesus Christ, it will but increase my recognition of the abundant grace of God. L. Berghoff, Grand Rapids, Michigan. August 1, 1949. The Doctrine of God. The Being of God. I. The Existence of God. A Place of the Doctrine of God in Dogmatics. Works on dogmatic or systematic theology generally begin with the doctrine of God. The prevailing opinion has always recognized this as the most logical procedure and still points in the same direction. In many instances, even they whose fundamental principles would seem to require another arrangement, continue the traditional practice. There are good reasons for starting with the doctrine of God, if we proceed on the assumption that theology is the systematized knowledge of God, of whom, through whom, and unto whom, are all things. Instead of being surprised that dogmatics should begin with the doctrine of God, we might well expect it to be a study of God throughout in all its ramifications, from the beginning to the end. As a matter of fact, that is exactly what it is intended to be, though only the first locus deals with God directly, while the succeeding ones treat of him more indirectly. We start the study of theology with two presuppositions, namely, 1, that God exists, and, 2, that he has revealed himself in his divine word. And for that reason it is not impossible for us to start with the study of God. We can turn to his revelation, in order to learn what he has revealed concerning himself and concerning his relation to his creatures. Attempts have been made in the course of time to distribute the material of dogmatics in such a way as to exhibit clearly that it is, not merely in one locus, but in its entirety, a study of God. This was done by the application of the Trinitarian method, which arranges the subject matter of dogmatics under the three headings of 1, the Father, 2, the Son, and 3, the Holy Spirit. That method was applied in some of the earlier systematic works, was restored to favor by Hegel, and can still be seen in Martensen's Christian Dogmatics. A similar attempt was made by Breckenridge, when he divided the subject matter of dogmatics into, 1, the knowledge of God objectively considered, and, 2, the knowledge of God subjectively considered. Neither one of these can be called very successful. Up to the beginning of the 19th century, the practice was all but general to begin the study of dogmatics with the doctrine of God, but a change came about under the influence of Schleiermacher, who sought to safeguard the scientific character of theology by the introduction of a new method. The religious consciousness of man was substituted for the word of God as the source of theology. Faith in scripture as an authoritative revelation of God was discredited, and human insight based on man's own emotional or rational apprehension became the standard of religious thought. Religion gradually took the place of God as the object of theology. Man ceased to recognize the knowledge of God as something that was given in scripture, and began to pride himself on being a seeker after God. In course of time it became rather common to speak of man's discovering God, as if man ever discovered him, and every discovery that was made in the process was dignified with the name of revelation. God came in at the end of a syllogism, or as the last link in a chain of reasoning, or as the capstone of a structure of human thought. Under such circumstances it was but natural that some should regard it as incongruous to begin dogmatics with the study of God. 
it is rather surprising that so many, in spite of their subjectivism, continued the traditional arrangement. Some, however, sensed the incongruity and struck out in a different way. Schleiermacher's dogmatic work is devoted to a study and analysis of the religious consciousness and of the doctrines therein implied. He does not deal with the doctrine of God connectedly, but only in fragments, and concludes his work with a discussion of the Trinity. His starting point is anthropological rather than theological. Some of the mediating theologians were influenced to such an extent by Schleiermacher that they logically began their dogmatic treatises with the study of man. Even in the present day this arrangement is occasionally followed. A striking example of it is found in the work of O.A. Curtis on the Christian faith. This begins with the doctrine of man and concludes with the doctrine of God. Richlian theology might seem to call for still another starting point, since it finds the objective revelation of God, not in the Bible as the divinely inspired word, but in Christ as the founder of the kingdom of God, and considers the idea of the kingdom as the central and all-controlling concept of theology. However, Richlian dogmaticians, such as Hermann Herring and Kaftan follow, at least formally, the usual order. At the same time, there are several theologians who in their works begin the discussion of dogmatics proper with the doctrine of Christ or of his redemptive work. T. B. Strong distinguishes between theology and Christian theology, defines the latter as the expression and analysis of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, and makes the incarnation the dominating concept throughout his manual of theology. Be scripture proof for the existence of God. For us the existence of God is the great presupposition of theology. There is no sense in speaking of the knowledge of God, unless it may be assumed that God exists. The presupposition of Christian theology is of a very definite type. The assumption is not merely that there is something, some idea or ideal, some power or purposeful tendency, to which the name of God may be applied, but that there is a self-existent, self-conscious, personal being, which is the origin of all things, and which transcends the entire creation, but is at the same time imminent in every part of it. The question may be raised, whether this is a reasonable assumption, and this question may be answered in the affirmative. This does not mean, however, that the existence of God is capable of a logical demonstration that leaves no room whatever for doubt, but it does mean that, while the truth of God's existence is accepted by faith, this faith is based on reliable information. While Reformed theology regards the existence of God as an entirely reasonable assumption, it does not claim the ability to demonstrate this by rational argumentation. Dr. Kuiper speaks as follows of the attempt to do this. The attempt to prove God's existence is either useless or unsuccessful. It is useless if the searcher believes that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. And it is unsuccessful if it is an attempt to force a person who does not have this pistis by means of argumentation to an acknowledgement in a logical sense. Dict. Dome. De Dio I. P. 77. Translation Mine. L. B. The Christian accepts the truth of the existence of God by faith. But this faith is not a blind faith, but a faith that is based on evidence, and the evidence is found primarily in Scripture as the inspired Word of God, and secondarily in God's revelation in nature. Scripture proof on this point does not come to us in the form of an explicit declaration, and much less in the form of a logical argument. In that sense the Bible does not prove the existence of God. The closest it comes to a declaration is perhaps in Heb. 11 to 6. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that seek after him. It presupposes the existence of God in its very opening statement, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Not only does it describe God as the creator of all things, but also as the upholder of all his creatures, 
and as the ruler of the destinies of individuals and nations. It testifies to the fact that God works all things according to the counsel of his will, and reveals the gradual realization of his great purpose of redemption. The preparation for this work, especially in the choice and guidance of the Old Covenant people of Israel, is clearly seen in the Old Testament, and the initial culmination of it in the person and work of Christ stands out with great clarity on the pages of the New Testament. God is seen on almost every page of Holy Writ as he reveals himself in words and actions. This revelation of God is the basis of our faith in the existence of God, and makes this an entirely reasonable faith. It should be remarked, however, that it is only by faith that we accept the revelation of God, and that we obtain a real insight into its contents. Jesus said, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, or whether I speak of myself. John chapter 7 verse 17. It is this intensive knowledge, resulting from intimate communion with God, which Hosea has in mind when he says, and let us know, let us follow on to know the Lord, Hos. 6-3. to The unbeliever has no real understanding of the Word of God. The words of Paul are very much to the point in this connection. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age, world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For, seeing that in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom knew not God, it was God's good pleasure through the foolishness of the preaching to save them that believe, I call. 1 20, 21. See denial of the existence of God in its various forms. Students of comparative religion and missionaries often testify to the fact that the idea of God is practically universal in the human race. It is found even among the most uncivilized nations and tribes of the world. This does not mean, however, that there are no individuals who deny the existence of God altogether, nor even that there is not a goodly number in Christian lands who deny the existence of God as he is revealed in Scripture, a self-existent and self-conscious person of infinite perfections, who works all things according to a predetermined plan. It is the latter denial that we have in mind particularly here. This may and has assumed various forms in the course of history. 1. Absolute denial of the existence of God. As stated above, there is strong evidence for the universal presence of the idea of God in the human mind, even among tribes which are uncivilized and have not felt the impact of special revelation. In view of this fact some go so far as to deny that there are people who deny the existence of God, real atheists, but this denial is contradicted by the facts. It is customary to distinguish two kinds, namely, practical and theoretical atheists. The former are simply godless persons, who in their practical life do not reckon with God, but live as if there were no God. The latter are, as a rule, of a more intellectual kind, and base their denial on a process of reasoning. They seek to prove by what seem to them conclusive rational arguments, that there is no God. In view of the semen religionis implanted in every man by his creation in the image of God, it is safe to assume that no one is born an atheist. In the last analysis atheism results from the perverted moral state of man and from his desire to escape from God. It is deliberately blind to and suppresses the most fundamental instinct of man, the deepest needs of the soul, the highest aspirations of the human spirit, and the longings of a heart that gropes after some higher being. This practical or intellectual suppression of the operation of the semen religionists often involves prolonged and painful struggles. There can be no doubt about the existence of practical atheists, since both scripture and experience testify to it. Psalm chapter 10 verse 4b declares of the wicked, all his thoughts are, there is no God. According to Peace, 14 to 1, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And Paul reminds the Ephesians that they were formerly without God in the world, E.P.H. 2.12.
experience also testifies abundantly to their presence in the world. They are not necessarily notoriously wicked in the eyes of men, but may belong to the so-called decent men of the world, though respectably indifferent to spiritual things. Such people are often quite conscious of the fact that they are out of harmony with God, dread to think of meeting Him, and try to forget about Him. They seem to take a secret delight in parading their atheism when they have smooth sailing, but have been known to get down on their knees for prayer when their life was suddenly endangered. At the present time thousands of these practical atheists belong to the American Association for the Advancement of Atheism. Theoretical atheists are of a different kind. They are usually of a more intellectual type and attempt to justify the assertion that there is no God by rational argumentation. Professor Flint distinguishes three kinds of theoretical atheism, namely, 1. Dogmatic atheism, which flatly denies that there is a divine being, 2. Skeptical atheism, which doubts the ability of the human mind to determine whether or not there is a God, and 3. Critical atheism, which maintains that there is no valid proof for the existence of God. These often go hand in hand, but even the most modest of them really pronounces all belief in God a delusion. Anti-theistic theories, p. 4f. In this division, it will be noticed, agnosticism also appears as a sort of atheism, a classification which many agnostics resent. But it should be borne in mind that agnosticism respecting the existence of God, while allowing the possibility of his reality, leaves us without an object of worship and adoration just as much as dogmatic atheism does. However, the real atheist is the dogmatic atheist, the man who makes the positive assertion that there is no God. Such an assertion may mean one of two things, either that he recognizes no God of any kind, sets up no idol for himself, or that he does not recognize the God of Scripture. Now there are very few atheists who do not in practical life fashion some sort of God for themselves. There is a far greater number who theoretically set aside any and every God, and there is a still greater number that has broken with the God of Scripture. Theoretical atheism is generally rooted in some scientific or philosophical theory. Materialistic monism in its various forms and atheism usually go hand in hand. Absolute subjective idealism may still leave us the idea of God, but denies that there is any corresponding reality. To the modern humanist, God simply means the spirit of humanity, the sense of wholeness, the racial goal, and other abstractions of that kind. Other theories not only leave room for God, but also pretend to maintain his existence, but certainly exclude the God of theism, a supreme personal being, creator, preserver, and ruler of the universe, distinct from his creation, and yet everywhere present in it. Pantheism merges the natural and supernatural, the finite and infinite, into one substance. It often speaks of God as the hidden ground of the phenomenal world, but does not conceive of him as personal, and therefore as endowed with intelligence and will. It boldly declares that all is God, and thus engages in what Brightman calls the expansion of God, so that we get too much of God, seeing that he also includes all the evil of the world. It excludes the God of Scripture, and in so far is clearly atheistic. Spinoza may be called the God-intoxicated man, but his God is certainly not the God whom Christians worship and adore. Surely, there can be no doubt about the presence of theoretical atheists in the world. When David Hume expressed doubt as to the existence of a dogmatic atheist, Baron Dolbach replied, My dear sir, you are at this moment sitting at table with seventeen such persons. They who are agnostic respecting the existence of God may differ somewhat from the dogmatic atheist, but they, as well as the latter, leave us without a God. 2. 
present-day false conceptions of God involving a denial of the true God. There are several false conceptions of God current in our day, which involve a denial of the theistic conception of God. A brief indication of the most important of these must suffice in this connection. a. An immanent and impersonal God. Theism has always believed in a God who is both transcendent and immanent. Deism removed God from the world, and stressed his transcendence at the expense of his immanence. Under the influence of pantheism, however, the pendulum swung in the other direction. It identified God and the world, and did not recognize a divine being, distinct from, and infinitely exalted above, his creation. Through Schleiermacher, the tendency to make God continuous with the world gained a footing in theology. He completely ignores the transcendent God, and recognizes only a God that can be known by human experience and manifests himself in Christian consciousness as absolute causality, to which a feeling of absolute dependence corresponds. The attributes we ascribe to God are in this view merely symbolical expressions of the various modes of this feeling of dependence, subjective ideas without any corresponding reality. His earlier and his later representations of God seem to differ somewhat, and interpreters of Schleiermacher differ as to the way in which his statements must be harmonized. Brunner would seem to be quite correct, however, when he says that with him the universe takes the place of God, though the latter name is used, and that he conceives of God both as identical with the universe and as the unity lying behind it. It often seems as if his distinction between God and the world is only an ideal one, namely, the distinction between the world as a unity and the world in its manifold manifestations. He frequently speaks of God as the univasum, or the weltall, and argues against the personality of God, though, inconsistently, also speaking as if we could have communion with him in Christ. These views of Schleiermacher, making God continuous with the world, largely dominated the theology of the past century, and it is this view that Barth is combating with his strong emphasis on God as the Holy Other. b. A finite and personal God. The idea of a finite God or gods is not new, but as old as polytheism and henotheism. The idea fits in with pluralism but not with philosophical monism or theological monotheism. Theism has always regarded God as an absolute personal being of infinite perfections. During the 19th century, when monistic philosophy was in the ascendant, it became rather common to identify the God of theology with the absolute of philosophy. Toward the end of the century, however, the term absolute as a designation of God, fell into disfavor, partly because of its agnostic and pantheistic implications, and partly as the result of the opposition to the idea of the absolute in philosophy, and of the desire to exclude all metaphysics from theology. Bradley regarded the God of the Christian religion as a part of the absolute, and James pleaded for a conception of God that was more in harmony with human experience than the idea of an infinite God. He eliminates from God the metaphysical attributes of self-existence, infinity, and immutability, and makes the moral attributes supreme. God has an environment, exists in time, and works out a history just like ourselves. Because of the evil that is in the world, he must be thought of as limited in knowledge or power, or in both. The condition of the world makes it impossible to believe in a good God infinite in knowledge and power. The existence of a larger power which is friendly to man and with which he can commune meets all the practical needs and experiences of religion. James conceived of this power as personal, but was not willing to express himself as to whether he believed in one finite God or a number of them. Bergson added to this conception of James the idea of a struggling and growing God, constantly drawing upon his environment. 
others who defended the idea of a finite God, though in different ways, a Hobhaus, Schiller, James Ward, Rashtel, and H. G. Wells. C. God as the personification of a mere abstract idea. It has become quite the vogue in modern liberal theology to regard the name God as a mere symbol, standing for some cosmic process, some universal will or power, or some lofty and comprehensive ideal. The statement is repeatedly made that, if God once created man in his image, man is now returning the compliment by creating God in his, man's, image. It is said of Harry Elmer Barnes that he once said in one of his laboratory classes, Gentlemen, we shall now proceed to create God. That was a very blunt expression of a rather common idea. Most of those who reject the theistic view of God still profess faith in God, but he is a God of their own imagination. The form which he assumes at any particular time depends, according to Shayla Matthews, on the thought patterns of that day. If in pre-war times the controlling pattern was that of an autocratic sovereign, demanding absolute obedience, now it is that of a democratic ruler eager to serve all his subjects. Since the days of Comte, there has been a tendency to personify the social order of humanity as a whole and to worship this personification. The so-called meliorists or social theologians reveal a tendency to identify God in some way with the social order. And the new psychologists inform us that the idea of God is a projection of the human mind, which in its early stages is inclined to make images of its experiences and to clothe them with quasi-personality. Luber is of the opinion that this illusion of God has served a useful purpose, but that the time is coming when the idea of God will be no more needed. A few definitions will serve to show the present-day trend. God is the immanent spirit of the community, Royce. He is that quality in human society which supports and enriches humanity in its spiritual quest, Gerald Bernie Smith. God is the totality of relations constituting the whole social order of growing humanity, e. s. Ames. The word, God, is a symbol to designate the universe in its ideal forming capacity, g. b. Foster. God is our conception, born of social experience, of the personality evolving and personally responsive elements of our cosmic environment with which we are organically related, Shayla Matthews. It need hardly be said that the God so defined is not a personal God and does not answer to the deepest needs of the human heart. D. The so-called rational proofs for the existence of God. In course of time certain rational arguments for the existence of God were developed, and found a foothold in theology especially through the influence of Wolf. Some of these were in essence already suggested by Plato and Aristotle, and others were added in modern times by students of the philosophy of religion. Only the most common of these arguments can be mentioned here. 1. The ontological argument. This has been presented in various forms by Anselm, Descartes, Samuel Clarke, and others. It has been stated in its most perfect form by Anselm. He argues that man has the idea of an absolutely perfect being, that existence is an attribute of perfection, and that therefore an absolutely perfect being must exist. But it is quite evident that we cannot conclude from abstract thought to real existence. The fact that we have an idea of God does not yet prove his objective existence. Moreover, this argument tacitly assumes as already existing in the human mind, the very knowledge of God's existence which it would derive from logical demonstration. Kant stressed the untenableness of this argument, but Hegel hailed it as the one great argument for the existence of God. Some modern idealists suggested that it might better be cast into a somewhat different form, which Hawking called, the report of experience. By virtue of it we can say, I have an idea of God, therefore I have an experience of God. 2. The cosmological argument. This has also appeared in several forms. In general it runs as follows, 
Every existing thing in the world must have an adequate cause, and if this is so, the universe must also have an adequate cause, that is a cause which is indefinitely great. However, the argument did not carry general conviction. Hume called the law of causation itself in question, and Kant pointed out that, if every existing thing has an adequate cause, this also applies to God, and that we are thus led to an endless chain. Moreover, the argument does not necessitate the assumption that the cosmos had a single cause, a personal and absolute cause, and therefore falls short of proving the existence of God. This difficulty led to a slightly different construction of the argument, as, for instance, by B. P. Baum. The material universe appears as an interacting system, and therefore as a unit, consisting of several parts. Hence there must be a unitary agent that mediates the interaction of the various parts or is the dynamic ground of their being. 3. The teleological argument. This is also a causal argument, and is really but an extension of the preceding one. It may be stated in the following form. The world everywhere reveals intelligence, order, harmony, and purpose, and thus implies the existence of an intelligent and purposeful being, adequate to the production of such a world. Kant regards this argument as the best of the three which were named, but claims that it does not prove the existence of God, nor of a creator, but only of a great architect who fashioned the world. It is superior to the cosmological argument in that it makes explicit what is not stated in the latter, namely, that the world contains evidences of intelligence and purpose, and thus leads on to the existence of a conscious, an intelligent, and purposeful being. That this being was the creator of the world does not necessarily follow. The teleological evidence, says Wright, a student's philosophy of religion, p. 341, merely indicates the probable existence of a mind that is, at least in considerable measure, in control of the world process, enough to account for the amount of teleology apparent in it. Hegel treated this argument as a valid but subordinate one. The social theologians of our day reject it along with all the other arguments as so much rubbish, but the new theists retain it. 4. The moral argument. Just as the other arguments, this too assumed different forms. Kant took his starting point in the categorical imperative, and from it inferred the existence of someone who, as lawgiver and judge, has the absolute right to command man. In his estimation this argument is far superior to any of the others. It is the one on which he mainly relies in his attempt to prove the existence of God. This may be one of the reasons why it is more generally recognized than any other, though it is not always cast into the same form. Some argue from the disparity often observed between the moral conduct of men and the prosperity which they enjoy in the present life, and feel that this calls for an adjustment in the future which, in turn, requires a righteous arbiter. Modern theology also uses it extensively, especially in the form that man's recognition of a highest good and his quest for a moral ideal demand and necessitate the existence of a god to give reality to that ideal. While this argument does point to the existence of a holy and just being, it does not compel belief in a god, a creator, or a being of infinite perfections. 5. The historical or ethnological argument. In the main this takes the following form. Among all the peoples and tribes of the earth there is a sense of the divine, which reveals itself in an external cultus. Since the phenomenon is universal, it must belong to the very nature of man. And if the nature of man naturally leads to religious worship, this can only find its explanation in a higher being who has constituted man a religious being. In answer to this argument, however, it may be said that this universal phenomenon may have originated in an error or misunderstanding of one of the early progenitors of the human race, and that the religious cultus referred to appears strongest among primitive races, and disappears in the measure in which they become civilized.
In evaluating these rational arguments it should be pointed out first of all that believers do not need them. Their conviction respecting the existence of God does not depend on them, but on a believing acceptance of God's self-revelation in Scripture. If many in our day are willing to stake their faith in the existence of God on such rational arguments, it is to a great extent due to the fact that they refuse to accept the testimony of the Word of God. Moreover, in using these arguments in an attempt to convince unbelievers, it will be well to bear in mind that none of them can be said to carry absolute conviction. No one did more to discredit them than Kant. Since his day many philosophers and theologians have discarded him as utterly worthless, but today they are once more gaining favor and their number is increasing. And the fact that in our day so many find in them rather satisfying indications of the existence of God, would seem to indicate that they are not entirely devoid of value. They have some value for believers themselves, but should be called testimonia rather than arguments. They are important as interpretations of God's general revelation and as exhibiting the reasonableness of belief in a divine being. Moreover, they can render some service in meeting the adversary. While they do not prove the existence of God beyond the possibility of doubt, so as to compel assent, they can be so construed as to establish a strong probability and thereby silence many unbelievers. Questions for further study. Why is modern theology inclined to give the study of man rather than the study of God precedence in theology? Does the Bible prove the existence of God or does it not? If it does, how does it prove it? What accounts for the general sensus divinitatis in man? Are there nations or tribes that are entirely devoid of it? Can the position be maintained that there are no atheists? Should present-day humanists be classed as atheists? What objections are there to the identification of God with the absolute of philosophy? Does a finite God meet the needs of the Christian life? Is the doctrine of a finite God limited to pragmatists? Why is a personified idea of God a poor substitute for the living God? What was Kant's criticism on the arguments of speculative reason for the existence of God? How should we judge of this criticism? Literature, Bavinck, Gereff, Dome, 2, pp. 52-74, Kuiper, Dict, Dome, De Doi, pp. 77-123, Hodge, Sist, Theol, I, pp. 202 to 243 shed dome theol i pp 221 to 248 dabney cyst and polem theol pp 5 to 26 macintosh theol as an empirical science pp 90 to 99 knudsen the doctrine of god pp 203 to 241 B.T., Apologetics, pp. 250-444, Brightman, The Problem of God, pp. 139-165, Wright, A Student's Phil. Of Rel, pp. 339-390, Edward, The Philosophy of Rel, pp. 218-305, Beckwith, The Idea of God, pp. 64 to 115 Thompson the Christian idea of God PP 160 to 189 Robinson the God of the liberal Christian PP 114 to 149 Galloway the Phil of rel PP 381 to 394